Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. This is a video on the blood vessels, video D, that focuses on the venous system. The three types of blood vessels that we find in the venous system include the venules. Venules are going to collect the blood from the capillaries, merge into bigger venules, and so on, to form eventually the veins. We have a third type of vein called a venous sinus that is a very thinly walled sac-like vessel. So they're not tube-like, but more like sacs. We've come across the coronary sinus. Remember, it collects most of the blood from uh, the cardiac veins and then drains into our um, right atrium along with the superior and inferior vena cava. In AMP1, you learn about the dural sinuses of the brain. For instance, your superior sagittal sinus is an example of a uh, vein we call a sinus. Finally, we, we do at times see that the veins participate in uh, vasoconstriction, and we're preferring to call that venoconstriction. The venules are the smallest vessels of the venous system, and those that leave the capillary beds, of course, are going to be the absolute smallest, and they're actually going to also be quite permeable to white blood cells. They're very thinly walled, all of them, um, but they still express the three tunics much, much thinner, though. They're microscopic vessels, so not very visible, if at all, with the bare eye. We've already mentioned in previous videos that the veins have a thick tunica adventitia, which is your outer layer, and not so much of a uh, tunica media, and therefore also not as many elastic fibers. What we do see in some of the veins, particularly in the limbs and the veins that sit inferior to the heart in the, in the trunk, is that the endothelium can form this fold, which we call a valve. You can see the valve right here, closed. We'll talk about the functions of the valves in another video. What I want to focus on here is the fact that our veins collectively, or the venous system, I should say, hold on to almost two-thirds of our blood. And because of that, we refer to the veins as capacitance vessels, or we can call them, or we can collectively refer to our veins as the blood reservoir. Finally, because there aren't so many elastic fibers in the walls of our veins, we find that the veins can distend just fine, meaning they can give way to the amount of blood inside of them, but they cannot easily recoil. So they can distend, but not recoil. And because of that, we say that they are compliant, which is very different from being elastic. The walls of arteries are elastic because they can distend and recoil due to the fact that they are rich in elastic fibers. Now, here we see a nice chart that lists the percentage of blood is, that is found in different portions of our circulation. And once again, notice that our systemic veins in particular hold most of our blood, which is why we call the, the veins to be our, we refer to our veins as our blood reservoir. If we compare the amount of blood in our systemic versus pulmonary circulation, clearly most of our blood is in our systemic circulation, much less in the pulmonary circulation, and even less in the heart. And then you can take a look at the distribution of the blood in all the other parts of the uh, circulatory system. So now that you're familiar with the arterial system, the capillaries, and the venous system, and their histology and their major functions, we're ready to discuss what is meant by anastomosis. Anastomosis is a term used to refer to a series of blood vessels that are organized in such a manner that the blood has an easy way of reaching or leaving a destination, even if there is blockage somewhere. Let me explain. First of all, we have three different forms of anastomosis. 
anastomosis can be occurring in the arterial system or the capillaries, and then we refer to it as an arteriovenous anastomosis, or just within the veins or venous system called venous anastomosis. Let's start from the bottom up. If you look at the back of your hand or the dorsal side of your hand, you have a lot of bluish looking veins there that branch and merge and branch and merge. And so they're draining your hand and there are different paths of veins that your blood can take to um, drain your, the backside of your hand. So if there happen to be damage to one of those veins, there's plenty of other ones um, for the blood to use. Capillaries are sort of an interesting form of anastomosis because we see arterial blood um, entering the capillaries, arterial blood that in this case is oxygen rich typically, and then the venous end being, being oxygen poor. And so the capillaries, because they, they literally look uh, like a a series, I'm sorry, let me draw this. If this is our arterial that feeds our capillaries, then we can perhaps illustrate our capillaries as such. Um, I'll just draw a few of them. And then they eventually merge to form, of course, our venule. And I'm running out of space here. There's our venule. And I'm not using different colors to indicate oxygenated versus not oxygenated. But we see our three capillaries here that feed into our venule and here's our arterial. So if there were damage to, let's say, this capillary, the blood could still use capillaries two and three, for instance. Now, if we take a look at arterial anastomosis, the coronary circulation is a very good example of how multiple coronary arteries will arise from, let's say, the left coronary artery or the right coronary artery and nourish the heart. But if damage, injury, blockage were present in one of those coronary arteries, there's always plenty of other coronary arteries to ensure that most of the heart is still supplied with blood. Of course, if there is severe occlusion in a coronary vessel, as you know, that portion of the heart might struggle with receiving enough nutrients and oxygen and therefore we might see a heart attack occurring. Still, in general, there's a lot of backup routes in the heart. Similar principle in deep within the brain, if we take a look over here, we're looking at the underside of the brain. Here we see the cerebellum and the spinal cord. And right here is our pituitary gland. Surrounding the pituitary gland, we have what is called the circle of willis. And we see all of these arteries um, somehow participating into eventually forming the circle of willis. I need for you to especially know the names of four vessels that feed into the circle of willis and that is the internal, the right and the left internal carotid artery that you see here, as well as here, and then also your left and right vertebral arteries that we see here and here. But as you can see from this picture, let's say there were an occlusion, a block, blockage right here in this particular part of the circle of Willis. Notice that the blood can still take this route to supply the blood to supply the brain with blood. So that's what we mean by anastomosis, the fact that we have a circulatory path designed in a particular region of the body that ensures that that particular region of the body will be supplied or drained of blood even if there were damage to one uh, vessel that creates this particular pathway. So this now wraps up our discussion of the different types of blood vessels that we find in our body along with their blood vessel wall histology.